Jackie Ashmore and I'm Executive Director of the Institute for Sustainable Energy. I'm really thrilled to get to moderate this panel session focused on distributional issues within countries and specifically what policies can address within country inequalities around carbon pricing. Um, I thought I'd just launch this by bringing back the comments that Professor Rudolfson shared yesterday. Uh, he had three background facts about within country inequality. I am literally quoting his slide word for word from here. Um, point one was income and consumption is distributed differently in different nations. Point two was climate damages will themselves be distributed in some way across the population and similarly for mitigation cost. And point three, if we know that the poor will not be adequately protected or compensated, then climate policy should directly respond to these inequalities. So um, I imagine those are gonna frame um, some of what we're going to hear from our three speakers. And with that, let's just launch in. Um, our first topic is carbon tax aggressivity and underlying inequalities quality. Uh, the work has been done jointly by Professor Atkinson, who is a professor of environmental policy in the Department of Geography and Environment at the London School of Economics. He is also an associate of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment. Professor Atkinson is on vacation, and so Mr. Anderson will be our presenter. Um, and welcome, Mr. Anderson, and we look forward to hearing, your, hearing about your research. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, lovely introduction. Uh, I think this talk will fit quite nicely after uh, Matos' uh, a very interesting uh, presentation earlier. And I, I hope to be able to shed some light maybe here on uh, the reasons why the Nordic countries were able to pass uh, carbon taxes in the early 1990s and why it's been more difficult in uh, other countries to do so. So... Uh, we're looking here in this paper on the distributional effects of uh, uh, carbon taxes on the, and especially looking at the role of income inequality. Uh, so let's see, sorry, yeah. So one major concern around carbon taxes are that they are regressive, right? Uh, that the tax burden increases less than in proportion to income, right? And uh, if taxes are not proportional, they're either regressive or progressive, but there are degrees of each, right? So this may change over time, or be different across countries. So uh, a typical example is uh, the distributional effects of a tax on gasoline that is uh, typically found to be quite regressive in the US, uh, less so in Europe, uh, even proportional in the Nordic countries. But if you look at research done for the distributional effects in developing countries, gasoline taxes are sometimes even progressive. So what we do in this paper is that we derive a quite simple model that shows that the two parameters of income inequality and the income elasticity of demand uh, may determine these changes in the distributional effects, either over time in one country or across countries. And more specifically, we find that if you put a tax on a necessity defined as a good with an income elasticity below one, uh, rising inequality will increase the degree of regressivity over time. And furthermore, if you see heterogeneity in the income elasticity across income groups, especially if the good is a relative luxury among the poor, this effect of increase in regressivity will be amplified. And so what we do is we use the Swedish carbon tax as a case study to test this model's predictions. So we look at the effect of using two different measures of income, annual versus lifetime income, where lifetime income is uh, often found to be more evenly distributed. And then we look at the, the change in progressivity across time in Sweden, also tested the assumption of the, the importance of heterogeneity of the income elasticity. And then lastly, we look at, uh, we compare earlier studies across countries. Uh, okay. So, Let's just start out with the models uh, quite straight away here. So it's quite simple. We have two types of households, uh, household A, which is the poor, and B, rich. And we have X here, which is income. So in time period T, the poor has a lower income uh, than households B, right? So we can view A and B as the bottom half and top half of the income distribution. And then the budget share for uh, a good I, which can be gasoline here in this case, for household B here, is dependent on the expenditure on um, 
in gasoline divided by total expenditure or income. So body share here is W, right? Then it's quite easy to show that changes to this uh, budget share for good I is determined by two parameters. So the first one here is the income elasticity of the budget share for good I, then multiplied by the growth rate of income. So these two variables determine how uh, the growth rate of the budget share changes over time. So note here that this income elasticity of the budget share for good I is linked to the income elasticity of the demand. Right, this is the equation here in the bottom. Right, so if the income elasticity is above one, uh, then an increase in income leads to a, a larger budget share. And similar, if it's below one, uh, an increase in income leads that this budget share decreases over time. Right, so this is typically why we refer to goods as necessities or luxuries. Right, if their income elasticity is above or below one, and then over time we get a more regressive or less progressive if it's if the overall effect is progressive we get a more regressive outcome over time if uh, the growth rate of this budget share is, is smaller for the rich household compared to the poor household and the opposite then we get a more uh, progressive outcome over time if the opposite is true right so if the budget share for the rich uh, grows faster than the budget share for the poor household and we then get no change over time if we have uh, unit elastic demand for all households, or if this uh, the uh, ratio of the income elasticity for the budget share is equal to the opposite ratios of the uh, growth rates of income. So we then have two, special, uh, two cases here, right? So the special case is where all households across the income distribution have the same uh, income elasticity of demand. Uh, and then we see an increase in regressivity if we have an increase in inequality and we have a tax on a good that is a necessity. But in the general case where we allow income elasticities to vary across the income distribution, uh, we see a similar increase in regressivity uh, if the good is a relative luxury uh, for the poorer households compared to the richer ones. So then it's the... Uh, it's the difference between the income elasticities across income groups that are important. Okay, and we can illustrate uh, the special case where we have uh, equal uh, income elasticities across all households and how this affects uh, the overall tax incidence. And this figure here shows what we have labeled as ISO incidence curve. It's basically along each of these curves, the distributional effect is constant. It doesn't change. So it's kind of analog to indifference curves. So on the y-axis here, you have the income elasticity of the budget share. And on the x-axis here, you have any kind of measure you can think of of income inequality. And we've picked Gini here. Right? So it's a, one of the most common summary statistics of inequality, you know, taking values from 0 to 100 and higher values are uh, associated with an increase or higher inequality. So above the x-axis here, all these uh, ISO incident curves are uh, outcomes for a progressive, overall progressive tax incidence. Uh, and below here, it's the overall tax incidence is regressive. It's okay. So how can we use this figure to understand changes over time or across countries? Well, uh, if we start here at point A, we can see this, uh, say this is a tax on gasoline in, in Sweden. And then over time, if inequality increases, uh, we may uh, end up at point B here. So we reach a more regressive outcome uh, over time due to an increase in inequality. Right? The income elasticity of demand is here kept constant over time. Then the difference between B and C here, we have the same level of uh, inequality but this may be the difference between tax and gasoline in two different countries. So B here will, will, may still be the situation in Sweden, but C might be a, a developing country where gasoline is a luxury good, right? So here the overall tax uh, incidence is uh, progressive. And this then is dependent on there's differences in the overall income elasticity of demand. So what kind of type of good gasoline is here? So here it's a luxury good. So this makes this can this figure can help us explain or understand why we see differences across countries in distributional effects of a tax on the same type of good, but also how uh, progressivity may change over time in one 
country. And so we test this predictions of the model using the case study of Sweden's carbon tax on transport fuel. And we, and we do four different tests of the model predictions, looking at what is the importance of the measure of income using annual versus lifetime income. And then looking at how this uh, overall uh, tax progressivity has changed over time in Sweden. And then the importance of this heterogeneity of the income elasticities. And lastly, we look at variation across high income countries. So just some overall background. So uh, Sweden's carbon tax was implemented in 1991. It's got partial coverage. So many sectors were, are exempt. It, it, this was especially true in the beginning, less so today. But the total rate is applied to mainly transport fuel. So around 90% of the carbon tax revenue comes from the consumption of uh, gasoline and diesel in Sweden. And we use household survey data uh, from 1999 to 2012. Uh, so that we have information on uh, household expenditure on uh, the carbon tax across all across the income distribution. And we use two measures of income here, which is annual income, uh, which is disposable income in each year. And then what is typical in the literature, uh, we use total expenditure as a proxy for lifetime income. And then carbon tax spend, uh, burden is then measured as a percentage of this income, so how much uh, of your overall income do you pay uh, for the carbon tax? But then to be able to um, measure a carbon tax progressivity summarized by just a simple number, we use uh, the most common uh, metric, which is the Suits Index, which was developed by Daniel Suits in an article in 1977 in the AER. And it's quite analog to the Gini Index in that it varies from plus one to minus one. And with plus one, you have extreme progressivity. Basically, all of the carbon tax uh, is paid for by the richest household. And then it, it goes to proportional, where all, where all households pay the same kind of, they have the same tip, uh, similar carbon tax burden. And then it goes to minus one with extreme regressivity, where all of the carbon tax burden is paid by the poorest households. So this, using the suit index, we can compare carbon tax progressivity across countries, but also within one country over time. Okay, so this is, let's look at the results. So this is um, the suits index here on the y-axis. Uh, and we have the years here for our sample period from 1999 to 2012. And the black line here is when we use lifetime income as the income measure. And then the red dotted line here is uh, when we use annual income. And so the first thing we can notice here that there's a change over time. So on both of these income measures, the carbon tax in Sweden has become uh, more regressive over time. So in 1999, it was uh, close to proportional, uh, even progressive on the lifetime income, but close to proportional use in annual income. But from 2007 and onwards, it has become more and more regressive. The second thing to notice is, here is that the income metric matter, right? So uh, if you use it, measure it using lifetime income, it's progressive in each year. Uh, but if you use, uh, measure it using annual income, the Swedish carbon tax is actually regressive. And it's the same, it's true in every year. And on both these measures follow a similar pattern over time. Okay, so why does the income metric matter? Well, we argue it does so because it changes the measured level of inequality. So how? Well. Remember earlier from the model, we stated that we get a more progressive or less regressive outcome if this is true, right? If the expanded or the, the budget share growth for the uh, richer households is larger than the budget growth for the poorer households. And if you change the income distribution, but not demand, right? So if you have household survey data here for carbon tax expenditure, the expenditure is fixed, right? The expenditure on on the gasoline here in Sweden. But if you change how you measure household income, uh, you, you change income, but not demand, right? So you're uh, in fact keeping uh, income elasticity as zero, right? So then the income elasticity of the budget share is minus one. And that leaves us this formula down to this. Basically what this means is that we get a more progressive outcome if the growth rate of income for the rich is smaller than the growth rate of income for the poor, 
basically that if we move to a measure of the income distribution that is more evenly distributed, you will always find a more progressive outcome in how you measure tax incidence, no matter the actual income elasticity of demand. I just want to give you a two minute warning. Okay. Yep, sure. Okay, and if we look at the data here from Sweden, we can see that the black solid line here is uh, income, disposable income, uh, and the dotted line down here is consumption. So this is the measure for lifetime income. And we can see in every year here that disposable income is more unevenly distributed. And this is true also for if you look at, typically true for across all the high income countries that this is how the data looks. Okay, so then if we look across time, you remember that you saw this variation over time that in, especially from 2007 and onwards, this, the carbon tax became more aggressive. And if we just regress that sim simple regression on the Gini coefficient for each year, we find a very strong uh, negative correlation here that as inequality in Sweden has grown over time, the Swedish carbon tax has become uh, more and more uh, regressive, right? So from being quite proportional in the beginning to quite regressive uh, in 2012. And then I, this, I'm, I'll just go qu quite quickly through this. This is, this is just a test of the importance of the heterogeneity of income elasticities. And we run a simple simulation scenario here where we find that this uh, assumption is kind of needed to, uh, to uh, get this, uh, replicate this observed change in the suits index that we find over time in Sweden. Uh, and this slide here shows the angle curve for gasoline demand in Sweden. And we can find that for the richer household, it's quite upward sloping. And there's a very low uh, income elasticity of demand for the rich, whereas for the, board, uh, for, whereas for the poor, it's more of a uh, uh, unit elastic to slight uh, luxury good. So there is this heterogeneity in uh, the income elasticities across income groups. But also we can see here that this right figure here is how income has changed over the time period. So we can see that for the rich, uh, the growth rate of income has been uh, quite a lot higher than for the poor deciles here. So these are the richest deciles here up in the right have experienced more than a 60% growth in income. Uh, and then lastly, if you just look across countries, we find the same kind of negative correlation here. So down here in the right corner is a lot of the studies done for the US on gasoline tax incidents from the 82 to 2003. And we can see that all of them find that gasoline tax incidents in the US are quite regressive, which is not surprising because the uh, US is kind of an outlier when it comes to income inequality. They've had consistently high uh, levels of inequality. Whereas if we look, especially across countries in Europe, uh, the story is quite more mixed and especially we have the Nordic countries up here in the left corner where in Denmark uh, gasoline tax incidents in their 90s were actually progressive <clears throat> even using annual income to measure uh, the tax progressivity here. So we can see that this is not kind of surprising that we have this uh, stylized fact in economics that the carbon tax would be regressive but we argue that it's mainly based on studies that use US data and if we look across uh, high income countries, the story would be uh, a bit different. So to just uh, conclude, uh, we show here that the, the two parameters of income inequality and the income elasticity of demand may determine changes in the distributional effect of a carbon tax across time and across countries. And then that uh, rise in inequality may increase the regressivity of a carbon tax on necessities. And if you want to mitigate climate change, uh, you should, uh, or economists recommend to apply a carbon tax on goods that are typically necessities in high income countries, right? So transport, fuel, food, heating, and electricity, and carbon taxes will thus likely be regressive in high income countries. The more so, the more unequal the distribution of income. And lastly, then to tie into Matto's talk earlier, we think that these results may explain why we first saw the introduction of carbon taxes in the Nordic countries in the early 1990s, because at that time, there were relatively and historically low levels of inequality at the time with Gini coefficients in the low 20s. So if you look at, for instance, Sweden, the carbon tax at the implementation were probably proportional to slightly progressive in its, uh, in its tax incidence. So this may explain why we don't see the same kind of level of opposition in the Nordic countries, than especially compared to 
the early examples of Australia and uh, France and the US. Okay, I'm finished. Sorry for running a bit over time. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. That was very interesting. And we move now to Christian Galeri speaking on tax incentives from, for green consumption. Professor Galeri holds a position at the University of Würzburg in Germany, and he has substantially influenced the spread of regional currencies in Germany through his leadership of the regional currency in Bavaria. We look forward to hearing from you. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, I will talk a little bit about tax incentives in um, combination with a, with a project I'm leading, um, it's a climate bonus project. And um, first I have to clarify the goals um, which uh, we have or which we have in our country. And um, the bigger picture is the social or ecological transformation. I would say it's more than uh, only reducing carbon dioxide. Um, but um, of course, we have to quantify the goals. And, and uh, one important measure is, is the carbon dioxide um, goal. And uh, Germany um, has, has now the goal of climate neutrality until 2045. It's, um, uh, it's a new law, um, only a few weeks old. We, we, have, we had a court um, judgment uh, by the highest court, and um, that was the basis to, to change the law. And uh, now we have the climate neutrality until 45. And um, it's an ambiguous goal. And when you, you look at the, um, at the annual goals, um, we have um, high, um, yeah, high quantities with um, about 50 million tons. That's about 8% in the first year's uh, reduction. And, um, and I think we have to do much to, to achieve these goals. And, And the questions are, uh, how do we transform the goals uh, to the regional level, the federal level? So every part of the country um, is um, doing everything to achieve the goal and which instruments work best and how do we minimize the costs um, to, to achieve these goals? And um, I'm working in a in a, a project called Climate Bonus. It's, it's a real laboratory. Um, we try to find best instruments or uh, best measurements, me me measurements to reduce uh, carbon dioxide. And um, the project is financed by the German Federal Ministry of, uh, for Environment. Um, so, the approach of a real world laboratory is an attempt um, to, to achieve effective results and an increase in knowledge under the given circumstances. And the framework conditions um, introduced by the project. And, the, um, and um, so we, um, yeah, we try to apply a systematic met methodology here to uh, to find out which instruments work best in the regional context and the regional, regional situation. Um, so we have three pillars in the climate bonus project. Uh, it's to measure, to reduce, and to compensate. And I want to give you uh, a few examples for the first thing is to measure the carbon dioxide. Um, it's on the voluntary basis, and we have um, businesses or companies who measure the carbon dioxide balance. And um, that's one example. Um, a company um, applies the greenhouse gas protocol, and they, um, they have a certain, a certain amount of uh, tons of carbon dioxide, and um, they can compensate their um, the carbon dioxide as a climate bonus fund, and they they pay a, 
uh, 100 euro per ton carbon dioxide in this fund. And it's also possible for a private person that I um, calculate with an internet calculator my own footprint and, and then I compensate it into the climate bonus fund with 100 euro. So um, we, we simulate a carbon tax, um, a quite high carbon tax where Germany has introduced a carbon tax in the beginning of the year of 25 euro. So it's what is about 28 or $30. And, um, and we simulate a higher carbon tax here with uh, an addition of 100 um, euros per ton. And then we have the basis uh, in, a, in, a, in a fund to to give incentives to, um, to people in the region or companies or institutions to reduce carbon dioxide. Um, one type of, um, of compensation is, um, is to, to invest into the nature. Um, that's, um, that's one example, humus formation in, in the region with, um, with a, um, with a farmer in the region who um, who uh, makes some organic soil um, measurements in his um, uh, in his um, farm, and he has uh, thirty hectares, and um, though he gets paid for the humus formation, and it will be measured in the beginning and after some years. And, and, and though he, he, uh, for, he gets some money for his performance um, to increase carbon dioxide in, uh, into his soil. Uh, another type of uh, compensation is um, the carbon dioxide reduction. So when I can't reduce my own carbon footprint, I give something into the fund and, and another person um, reduces the carbon dioxide. And, and we have some examples like the insulation of a house, um, which saves about three tons of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide a year, or to replace a heating, which uh, saves um, six tons of carbon dioxide. And um, uh, another example is the denim hospital, which uh, repairs uh, jeans or denim, um, um, which saves about 30 kilo of uh, carbon dioxide. And we calculate all the um, incentives and all the effects of, um, of the measurements in, uh, um, in the project. And uh, at the time, we have an, a whole effect of about 2,300 tons in, in the practice of one year. And we try to find out um, how much are the costs for each um, uh, incentive and, and what is the effect. And, um, and um, so we try to optimize the different um, possibilities here. Um, so we had the repair of the genes and that was uh, the difference of 31 kilogram. So when I don't buy a new uh, genes um, and I repair it, I, I um, uh, save 31 kilogram and, and we give an incentive of one climate bonus here. Um, when you look at the um, local level, we have uh, one partnership with the city of Traunstein. And uh, when you calculate the reductions of the national level to the city level, uh, we have um, the need for the reduction of 10,000 tons a year, um, because uh, the city is um, emitting 175,000 tons of carbon dioxide. So that would be the path. And when you compare the effect of the climate bonus project with 2,300 tons, um, it's uh, 
not too bad when you have the goal of 10,000 uh, tons. So it, it would be one possibility for a city to engage in the reduction of carbon dioxide. And um, we have one program with the city and um, they subsidize the installation, for example, a solar panel installment on a private house and uh, you have about eight kilowatts um, and you get, you get a subsidy of 1000 um, euro climate bonus and it's not paid in euro, it's paid in the, in the regional currency, Chiemgauer. And, and then you can see some additional effects here because it will be spent for sustainable um, consuming or for short transport ways and it circulates in the regional economy. And uh, so we try to combine um, the reduction of carbon dioxide with, uh, yeah, with the circulation within the region. And uh, everybody should um, have a focus on sustainable production um, mechanisms. And um, in the climate bonus project, we try to apply some principles. Um, of that's uh, the transparency for the calculation of the carbon dioxide, and um, but it has to be addition uh, in addition. So uh, it has to be a contribution to the reduction path of the city or the country. Um, other principles um, are security for investors. So it must be um, good to plan uh, and um, you should avoid excess, excess returns. So uh, nobody should have too much profits out of the subsidies. Uh, the principle, another principle is it, sh it should be effective. So um, the costs should be minimized. And um, another principle is the market integration. So um, that we don't produce something which the market, which the market doesn't need. For example, um, renewable energy, uh, which would be too much, for example. And um we have seen some problems with uh, with the producer surplus i i have the um so when we look at the macro level we have an, a law for renewable energy since the year 2000 in germany and uh, it was a big success when you look at the share of re renewable energies. Uh, so we have um, now about half of, uh, of the energy mix, which is produced uh, with re renewables. And, but we have seen um, some um, problems with the, with the subsidies because they were too, too fixed and not flexible enough. And, and so the, the subsidy was too much uh, in comparison to the saved um, carbon dioxide. Um, I have calculated it with, um, with about uh, 230, 250 euros per ton. And um, now it is reduced um, or, or changed the law and the, the current uh, subsidy is about 100 30 euro per ton um, when you look at um, private households with small inst uh, solar panel installments. So it's corrected, but uh, it's very important to, to have it um, monitored and, and to, to avoid excessive producer surpluses. So I think it's, um, it's very good to uh, combine micro and macro approaches. And um, I think carbon taxes are a wonderful instrument for funding. Um, also decentral uh, approaches. And, and so you can reward the reduction of carbon dioxide. And um, I think um, decentral approaches are 
quite effective um, to find good solutions for incentives and to optimize the instruments. And um, another advantage is you can use a multiplier effects in the region uh, to, to reduce costs further. And when you have um, good examples in the in the decentralized uh, environment, you can scale it up on the um, national level or, or higher levels. And um, so I think, um, yeah, we need more real laboratories in combination with um, the research of macro and micro. And I think that was the lesson for us in the project. So thank you. Thank you, Christian. That was uh, a great presentation. And our third presenter is Professor Paul. Uh, Professor Paul is an assistant professor for economics and environmental studies at New College of Florida. Uh, he's an political economist working in the areas of inequality, environmental economics, and applied microeconomics. Um, and he'll talk to us about the political economy of carbon dividends. Thank you, Professor Paul. Good morning, everybody from the West Coast. Um, Thank you uh, for having me this morning. So today I'm gonna to be presenting joint work uh, with colleagues Anders Fremstad, Matt Mildenberg, who you heard from earlier today, and Isabel, Isabella uh, Stadelman. Um, so <clears throat> first, just take a, a step back for a moment. My, my main research agenda is really focused on deep decarbonization and thinking about distributional implications of that. Um, any large reorganization of the economy is going to have major redistributive consequences um, and so I think that, you know, we need to be keenly aware of these as we consider different, different pathways for decarbonization. Um, so this is, this is ongoing work um, right now where we're looking at public support for a high carbon price and if the, you know, the potential role of, of rebates and, and building support. Um, so economists <clears throat> advocate carbon pricing as the primary tool to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I, as an economist, actually um, take some issue with that. I don't think that carbon pricing is necessarily the most efficient way uh, to reduce emissions, um, but I see it as one of the three legs of the climate policy stool, the other two being uh, large-scale public investment and, and smart regulations. Um, but, you know, despite the fact that economists and, and walks around the globe really love carbon pricing, we know that very few governments have actually adopted a CO2 price high enough to meet emission targets um, and that's because of, you know, uh, in terms of what I'm talking about, there are really two things. One is carbon prices are either too low and or carbon prices cover far too a few percentage of emissions in a given, given area. Um, there's a number of different areas that political challenges may stem, stem from. One of the biggest, though, is the regressivity of carbon pricing schemes. Um, so people are really worried that we're, we're going to tax away a substantial portion of their, their income. Um, Studies to date do find um, some majority support for carbon pricing, um, but interestingly, they really find that uh, support tapers off as the carbon pricing increases. Um, and you know, various studies indicate that we, you know, a, a quote unquote effective carbon price to help us meet international targets is likely substantially higher than current levels being debated uh, by most, most governments. Um, the studies to date, though, there's really very few that have personalized the cost and benefit information, um, and really none that have tested a, what, what we deem to be a sufficiently high carbon price. Um, you know, studies tend to show show participants, you know, what the average uh, tax incidence and potential rebate is, uh, but we know that there's a huge variation in tax incidences across households. We should really be aware of averages in this case. Now. What, what's fascinating is that the willingness to pay literature really um, attributes the fall in support to the idea that people aren't willing to pay very much for climate change. And in particular, low-income people aren't willing to pay very much. And part of the argument there is they don't have the ability to pay very much. Um, but what this, you know, what I want to argue is this fails to appreciate that through smart policy design, actually most people don't need to pay much at all um, to address climate change um, it, with proper, say, incorporation of dividends. So in this paper, we ask if dividends can increase public support for carbon pricing. And we do this by um, running survey data, both in the US and Switzerland. Um, we test a uh, low carbon price, which we, we uh, 
use $50 a ton of CO2 and then a high carbon price, which is we use $230 a ton of CO2. This comes from a 2019 Nordhaus paper where Nordhaus argues that 230 is needed to put us on a pathway of uh, 2.5 C. Um, so even that, of course, may not be sufficient, but there's a wide variation in the literature in thinking about what the proper, proper carbon price is, um, largely because we just don't know the elasticities. Um, one of the novel um, parts of this paper is that we're using a carbon footprint calculator to try to provide households with more accurate information regarding their incidence and rebate associated with carbon price. Um, and then we also look at if these are results are robust to political messaging. And, and here I've learned a great deal from Maddow's work where, you know, we can test these things uh, kind of in a bubble, but that's, that's not how real world legislation is passed, of course. Um, so for the carbon uh, footprint calculator, we draw on work that I did with my colleague Anders Fremstad earlier. Um, and what we're basically doing is creating a five by five matrix to sort uh, people by both household size and income quintile. Um, and this gives us a rough approximation as to their carbon footprint and in turn the incidence of the carbon price. Um, we then conduct surveys both in the US and Switzerland of roughly 1500 uh, participants. Um, and this is really gonna allow us to test public support um, across the two different tax rates, um, whether or not a rebate is present, and also when people are exposed to partisan framing regarding carbon pricing. And here we're pulling more or less directly from past um, debates in the United States um, and using partisan messaging from the left and right respectively. So in terms of inequality, um, I wanna spend a moment on this graph here. So what we're looking at is five different um, quintiles. Um, on the left, the darker blue bars essentially show um, what the monthly cost is of a $230 carbon tax. So for the lowest income households, they're going to be paying about $300 a month. And all the way to the right, the highest income households are going to be paying about $800 a month. However, if we think about this as a percentage of income, the first quintile is going to be paying nearly 15% of their income. Um, given the fact that we know that 40% of Americans don't even have $400 in the bank to cover emergency expense, you know, we should really be concerned with taxing away nearly that much every month. Um, and that's, that, you know, to me, it's being concerned about inequality. That, that's something that I, I don't think we can accept. Um, at the same time, we see just how regressive this the initial incidence of this tax is. Um, so, you know, on the right hand side, cost as a percentage of income for the, the wealthy, even though the tax is higher in dollar terms, you know, we're talking about less than 5% of their income. Um, so there, there's large variation in how this will affect uh, different, different households. I think this is particularly important because a lot of studies to date look at carbon pricing and say using the revenue for green investments, which is really popular when people don't fully understand what the actual cost would be to them. Um, but I'd posit that I, I don't think we should be using regressive taxation to fund investments and in, in clean, clean energy solutions. So <clears throat> regarding our results, as I, as I mentioned, we kind of essentially have eight treatments where we're, we're looking at um, the effect of a rebate and high low carbon price. So for focusing first on the left um, column, which is looking at the United States, uh, we see that um, public support falls um, in terms of uh, having a larger carbon price. That's essentially what we'd expect. We do, however, see fairly high levels of support for both a low and high carbon price. Um, what's really interesting is that when we introduce a rebate, um, we actually see uh, very high levels of support in the United States for both a low and high carbon price. And actually what we're seeing here is that a hard, high carbon price has essentially the same level of support as a low carbon price when rebates are included. Um, so here, again, we're, we're providing information to respondents, um, both about their incidence and about how much they're going to be getting back for the rebate so that households really have decent information to understand how this will affect my net budget on, uh, uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, so, so I do find these results to be fairly encouraging in terms of potential support for carbon pricing and rebates. And we see, of course, substantially higher support uh, with, with the inclusion of the rebate. In Switzerland, um, we see a, a more moderated story. Um, first, you know, I do want to mention that Switzerland does have one of the largest carbon prices in the world already. Um, they're, I believe, the third largest carbon price in the world. Um, however, that only covers roughly a third of emissions. So it is not an economy wide carbon price, which is what we model uh, in this paper. Um, and in the Swiss case, 
this survey was done in the middle of a referendum. So um, the you know, carbon pricing was much more, I think, at the forefront of citizens' minds at the time. And what we see, first of all, is lower levels of support for carbon prices across the board. Um, and we do kind of, as expected, see lower levels of support for a higher carbon price as opposed to a low carbon price. Um, the central idea that rebates significantly increase support holds here in Switzerland as well, um, where we see majority support for a low tax and rebate. Um, however, uh, you know, support does indeed fall in this case and at the high tax and rebate condition, calling the question the idea in the United States that you know the, the carbon price may not matter that much if the inclusion of a rebate is present. Um, and just to give folks an idea, in, in our modeling, we essentially find about 61% of households come out ahead in the carbon price and rebate scheme. Um, and what we're doing there is actually fully rebating revenue back to the government in order to keep the government whole as well and just rebating money people pay in back to the people. Uh, now, what we want to look at is the causal effect of rebates on various policy measures. So starting down at the bottom, looking at the orange bars, what we really see is that the orange bar represents support for the policy. And what we're finding is that um, this is focusing on the US first, substantial increases in support for the policy with the inclusion of a rebate, in particular around uh, low-income households. Now, this is interesting because low-income households tend to have lower support for a lot of environmental measures, again, often you know, due to willingness to pay arguments. Um, but once we, once we alleviate low-income households' financial burden, we're seeing that, that they're much more uh, interested in supporting such a policy. One thing that's, you know, we find pretty fascinating is, is how these different measures of carbon belief tend to move fairly hand in hand. Uh, the other important thing here is that we're not seeing reduced support amongst high income households in the United States with the inclusion of a rebate, even though they're being told they're, they're net losers under this policy. So, so we, I think that's encouraging as well. Now in Switzerland, um, you know, again, the case is a bit more moderated. We do see modest increases in support amongst low-income households. However, you know, um, marginally, um, you know, they're, they're not strong results in the least. Um, and we do see modest declines in the, in the Swiss case amongst high-income households. Um, and that, that is a potential sign of calling into question how much can carbon rebates really bridge um, political divides over carbon pricing and build broader coalitions in particular across, across income uh, coal groups. So, Finally, you know, we were interested in looking at whether these results were going to be robust to the inclusion of political messaging. Um, and what we're finding both in the Swiss and US cases that overall, the inclusion of political messaging uh, doesn't, doesn't have a significant effect on support for carbon pricing. However, we do see some, some interesting and potentially concerning um, results regarding uh, polarization. Um, so the, the I think the result that concerns us the most is that in both cases, we see reduced support amongst those in the center, um, perhaps due to you know, aversion to, to political conflict. Um, so we see both the, the center party in Switzerland and the independence in the United States reduce support uh, when, when partisan measure, uh, measures are introduced. Um, and that's an area I think that, that really warrants further research to think about how is it that you know, independents are responding to these types of policies and, and, and what can be done to, to try to bring them on board? So you know, just to briefly recap, our results essentially show that rebates do indeed increase public support um, by building, um, especially building support amongst low-income groups, which are, are one of the uh, most important groups to, to bring on board with various environmental measures. Um, we're saying that rebates can help elevate support even at very high carbon prices. So, you know, again, no papers really looked at support levels for, for carbon prices uh, much above the $70 range. And we're looking here at $230. Um, and we see that support is elevated even in the presence of partisan messaging. Now, in the Swiss case, um, the inclusion of rebates no longer, it does positively, but no longer significantly increases support uh, once partisan messaging is included. And I should note that the, the Swiss case did fail the referendum on carbon pricing um, by an extremely narrow margin, I think 51.6% uh, vote against um, just a few weeks back. Um, you know, in, in the US, I am slightly encouraged by the results that 
um, very high, high carbon prices may be viable with the inclusion of rebates. But of course, you know, the, the word of caution is that, well, why don't we have them then? Um, it's easy to test these policies, but, but much harder to, to actually implement them. Um, and, you know, another thing that I think really uh, continues to, to deserve further attention, as Matt alluded to earlier, is, is the idea of how to balance um, what people actually see and think here. So in the SWIFT case, there are already rebates, uh, but they're not highly visible. And in the survey data that we do, we really do make the rebates very highly visible and, and balance um, how much people are exposed to costs and, and, and benefits as well. And, and how likely is that to actually be replicated in the real world case. Um, and you know, I think in general, the, the partisan messaging um, should be concerning that it increases polarization, but also largely should be expected as well. Uh, we know that, that people sort themselves into groups um, and that partisan messaging essentially helps them, them sort each other, themselves into groups. Thank you.